This is a story about making a difference. What was the moment that made you think this is something that I could do something about? If you can help other moms to go through a lesser strain, lesser side effects, that's simply great. Cobalt has the worst forms of child labor, and that really touched all of us. I think we can make a solution that is not just for the privileged, but would affect the entirety of the country as well. It's a growing movement. Visionaries are taking on the world's biggest challenges and driving positive, sustainable change. This film tells the story of three first-time social entrepreneurs determined to make a difference. One Billion Lives is an intrapreneurship program that takes the passion of our employees and it gives them permission to choose to make a difference. Throughout history, innovations were made by pioneers. Vaccination now will save lives from death or paralysis this year. From Jonas Salk, inventor of the polio vaccine, to Norman Borlag, the man whose modified wheat strain saved millions of lives from famine. Now with the world facing fresh challenges, a new generation of social enterprises are using technology, science, and communication to impact billions of lives. Social enterprises are businesses that choose to make a difference, to take the profit that they generate and push that profit to really make a difference in somebody's life. I think business is more fast and powerful to change the world than any other function from politics to war to disease. The social impact is probably greater on the commercial side. Social enterprise can address environmental problems, humanitarian problems, by thinking of them as what is an opportunity to build something that has a value that addresses a problem. One Billion Lives is the brainchild of Adair Fox Martin. The program gives SAP employees time, technology, and mentorship to establish sustainable social ventures. Fortune Top 50 Most Powerful Women, the wonderful Adair Fox Martin. Thank you very much, Peter. I'd just like to say that we are thrilled to join the ranks of so many like-minded organizations who recognize the value and the potential that the social enterprise sector represents. We're experiencing a time of tremendous growth in the global economy, but this growth is creating greater disparity and greater inequality. And I think a company like SAP has the opportunity to choose to make a difference. Building on SAP's global network of motivated staff, One Billion Lives is able to address complex international challenges. I think there's a number of factors that play into any successful entrepreneurial journey, whether it's purposeful or, or, or traditional. I think the first is action is king. You have to start doing, you know. Don't think, don't discuss, don't ideate too much, create. The Philippines is one of the most disaster-prone regions on Earth. These islands are regularly assaulted by earthquakes, typhoons and volcanic eruptions. Luisa Ramiento is passionate about using technology to help. It is very important for me to help the Philippines because I am a Filipino and I think that speaks for itself. I've seen everything from poverty, from how people are affected after disaster strikes, to lack of education, to many more social issues in the country. And that's something that I'm really passionate towards. Luisa is traveling to Porak, a town that was recently hit by a devastating 6.5 magnitude earthquake that killed 16 people. Luisa's colleague, Rio, saved for six years to build this house. Just as it was nearing completion, the earthquake hit. Hi, Hi Luisa. Hi. Hi, Gio. The family is still living in the house, but Rio is worried about structural damage. This wall is no longer safe after the earthquakes. 
Did you see the walls moving when... No, we, we, we ran away immediately. Oh. <laughs> we stay outside until midnight because oh, wow. there are a series of aftershocks after the uh, big quake. If I'm not mistaken, this is the, the uh, biggest earthquake I've ever felt. Rio and his family were among the lucky ones. When the earthquake struck, this four-story supermarket collapsed, killing five people and trapping others beneath the rubble. And then we have here the uh, headquarters for the our responder. Francis Caligagan headed the search and rescue teams sent in to help. I assume you immediately mm, responded. Yeah. How did you do it? First, we have to assess the situation. Mm -hmm. Since our uh, rescue equipments are not enough for, the, mm -hmm. for this operation, so we asked the assistance from the province and the other uh, national government agencies. In the critical first few hours after the earthquake, Francis's team received hundreds of phone calls and text messages from victims and witnesses. Would you say that collaboration is key when uh, responding to disasters? It is important that we have teamwork with the mm -hmm. other agencies. So this is a big factor mm -hmm. in the success of our operation. Louisa and her team have designed an innovative app which helps coordinate response efforts and potentially save lives. With this app, we can actually uh, make that collaboration easier and faster and seamless. Organizations can select either shelter, nutrition, or sanitation and health, etc. So if they're bringing rice or uh, medicine, whatever is needed in the area. Other organizations can see it on the dashboard. Mm -hmm. They can respond to the person involved in that activity. So you can make intelligent decisions with your collaboration. And at the end of the day, of course, we have the achievements dashboard. How many people we have impacted in terms of shelter, health, wash, nutrition, etc. Louisa believes that the Relief.io app will revolutionize disaster relief in the Philippines that if you provide the opportunity to unleash the passion, that the benefits that you get, not just as a business, but the benefits that you deliver to the communities that you serve can be beyond your imagination. Over 4,000 kilometers away, in the city of Chennai, Varada Krishnamurthy has seen an opportunity to radically rethink cancer care in India. Three weeks after joining SAP on a preset role, my mother was diagnosed for uh, cancer. Varada was able to access some of the best cancer care in the country for his mother. But watching her go through aggressive cancer treatments was still uh, difficult. In a way, the that picture gives me a shock. I thought I won't stay, I, I won't be alive for a long period. His mother was treated by Dr. Ramesh, who has been taking an innovative approach to cancer care for the past 20 years. <laughs> they brought you here, huh? <laughs> Varada started to realize how lucky his mother was and wanted to help make better treatment available. Dr. Ramesh's research indicated that cancer treatment with a high survival rate in Europe was not replicated across India. There are economic and geographical reasons for this, but Dr. Ramesh believes that one solution lies in the data. In India, we don't have data for our own people, not only for treatments, uh, but also the efficacy of the treatment and the toxicity of the treatment and the cost effectiveness at the end of it. Research on cancer is based on data collected on people of European heritage. But Dr. Ramesh realized this meant Indian patients were often getting treatments too aggressive for their genetic makeup. The point of data actually helping you to change and modify the treatment according to the patient's needs and tolerance. Dr. Ramesh had been collecting data on his own patients and had developed innovative software to help process it but the project was limited in its scope and sample size. Varada saw an opportunity to help. I still remember the conversation. He says that I want to do something which is good for millions of patients. Varada and Dr. Ramesh put in a proposal to the One Billion Lives program, and to their delight, it was successful. 
Nivaran was born, a project that is radically rethinking cancer care in India. Actually, when I got this, I, I never knew that uh, I, I lived this long. It's been uh, three years and uh, it's been great. Yeah, yeah, no, that's fine. Uh, uh, you know, the, from three onwards, we'll get everything. With the support of One Billion Lives, Dr. Ramesh has been able to triple his database to over 800,000 patients in just three years. Social enterprise in medicine has an enormous place. Essentially, the world is a lot healthier right now than it has ever been before, and I'm absolutely certain that a large element of that is because of social enterprise. Sixty percent of the world's cobalt is from the Democratic Republic of Congo. This is an essential component of lithium batteries, which power everything from mobile phones to electric cars. Cobalt is often mined by children as young as six, who live and work in appalling conditions. <laughs> For both consumers and manufacturers, the supply chain is so complex, it's often difficult to tell how the cobalt is actually mined. That is something that Vikram Nigendra is trying to change. We all use mobile phones and iPads every day, and that has batteries. And now, increasingly, we have started driving electric cars, which has even bigger batteries. CoPro is one of the youngest One Billion Lives projects. Vikram and his colleague Eleanor are in Paris for an international mining conference. Signing up key partners is their first step towards using technology to create transparency in the cobalt supply chain. For us, finally we're in a room where all the stakeholders are there, not just to improve their products for their bottom line, but to improve their products for the social impact that it's going to have, right? This is an exciting moment for Vikram and the team. Heads of state, diplomats, and business leaders are all here. They want to ensure that the cobalt we need for a green energy future is mined ethically. We need to have congruence or uh, commonality in approach. And I think it is on the basis of that that you are all here. Some of the most important participants at the conference are the Congolese representatives. They're hoping to improve conditions in the mines. The problem we have is that you have mining, activities are going on, and at the same moment, people are going more and more and more poor. I feel incredibly proud. It's, it's been an amazing journey. So far, Vikram's project has been well received, but to really change the industry, he needs to convince businesses that an ethical supply chain won't undermine profits. I think profit is really important. It's like having a heartbeat. You know, you need that as a business to survive. But is that the reason for its existence? Shouldn't it be what it does, you know, what service it provides or what product it makes is the reason for its existence and profit is more of an indicator of health. This is business, right? This isn't charity donations. This isn't doing good for doing good's sake. This is doing good business. Back at the Houses of Parliament, Adair is meeting some of the UK's leading social entrepreneurs. Can I send someone your way? Because one of our ventures last year is working with all of the NGOs that manage disasters. I, I, I've been involved in social enterprise for 10 years. So for me, it's a social aspect. So our son is autistic, right? Yeah. And when he was 12 years old, uh, we started to get worried what he will do once he grows up. But that's great. No, I'd be very happy to connect with you in my car. Yeah. Social enterprise is the fastest growing form of business. They're the businesses that employ more women, more black people. They're the businesses that are contributing more to the British economy than agriculture. They're the businesses who pay, you know, the 11th largest taxpayer is a social enterprises. Five social enterprises pay more taxes and contribute to the economy of this country than Twitter, Google, Facebook, you know, put together, put together. So it's kind of, it's a no brainer. I, I think the social enterprise has become a movement and it's a movement that nobody's actually defined but it's a it's a movement because 
it's not just about head, it's about heart. When you speak to social entrepreneurs, you know, again, that sense of passion, that sense of energy, that sense of conviction, there's something that typifies all of them. So I think they do an incredible job of filling the gap that, you know, the fast growth of our economies and of society has created for very, very many people in the planet today. The data tools that Nivaran are developing have the potential to help other organizations facing the same issues across India. Deep in the Tamil Nadu countryside, radiologists from the WIA Cancer Institute are working with the Shadi Gans Foundation Mamamobile Charitable Trust to encourage rural women to get screened for cancer. With most patients unable to access cancer screening, mobile radiology units like the Mamamobile project are a lifeline. In breast cancer, early detection is the one um, factor that hugely influences the outcome of the disease. We all know in Western countries, even though the incidence of breast cancer is high, the mortality is lower, whereas it is vice versa in our country. Today we are expecting 10 to 15 women. Here we will place the breast. Dr. Malaga, who is the leading oncologist on the project, says that collection of data will be important in helping battle cancer across the country. India is a huge country. The incident cancer patterns are different. The changing cancer trends are different. So the whole country has different cancer patterns. The top five cancers may differ from state to state. Mobile units like these collect an enormous amount of information, but it's often processed by hand which holds back research into new treatments. The lifeline will be the data. If there is software to quickly learn from what we are doing and then change our practices quickly, then that will be beneficial to us and also to the population. Back in Chennai, Varada's mum is now cancer-free. Nivaran, supported by <laughs> one billion lives, has been able to sign up four hospitals to the database. The number of patients we had in 2017 were around 3,500. And if we think of 10 hospitals getting together in one year, so you can go on and on. And if we look at nationwide, it will be enormous, just huge. Bye. Back in the Philippines, 100 kilometers from the scene of the collapsed supermarket, Lourdes Martin, is living with the aftermath of the earthquake. Lima po kaming nakatira dito sa bahay. Kasama po yung bunso kong kapatid, mama at papa ko, tsaka po yung boyfriend ko pa. Until the earthquake, she was the primary breadwinner for the family, supporting them by working in a phone shop at the supermarket. It was her first job. Tapos segundo lang po, bumagsak na po yung building. Tumakbo po ko mga dalawa o tatlong hakbang lang kaso po hindi po ako naka naabutan uh, nabasag natamaan po yung ulo ko nabasag po yung ulo ko tapos uh, napahiga po ako tapos naipit po yung paa ko to get lourdes out of the rubble rescuers had no choice but to amputate her leg using the only tool they had available a construction saw parang ang hirap pa rin po tanggapin hanggang ngayon since the amputation Lourdes' girlfriend has moved in with her to care for her and help support the family. It's been a month and a half since Dr. Noelito Laksamana amputated Lourdes' leg. Hello. Dr. Laksamana was at the hospital doing his daily rounds when he heard about the supermarket collapse. It was very difficult because there was no light. The situation is not that very conducive for, for surgery, but uh, that's the only option that uh, we have in order to save her. The doctor believes that an app like Louisa's would have helped in the immediate aftermath of the disaster. We don't have sophisticated equipment to, to aid us in, in communicating. The dream is to have a central communicating system for disaster management in order to help those affected with the disaster. That would really be of help. 
Vikram has come to give Adair an update on his project combating child labor in the cobalt supply chain. So what's happening? We are right now in the final stages of signing a partnership with a company called Impact. It's a 30-year-old NGO who have been nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize in 2003 for their efforts in Blood Diamond. Um, so they have very strong methodologies in formalizing artisanal mines and making sure that the socioeconomic situations of communities is improving. Well, that's amazing. Great job, Vikram. So Thank proud you. of you and the team. It's awesome. It's incredible that we can now realize that idea step by step. And we probably wouldn't have been able to do this without one billion lives. The success of projects like Nivaran in India is inspiring the next generation of social entrepreneurs. What are they here? Chirag and Narayang work in Bangalore and are hoping their one billion lives idea will tackle preventable blindness in babies. As you can see here, there are different angles that are being captured. So the doctor can primarily look at these. And what he can do is he can immediately go ahead and notify the patient for action. Yeah. But looking at it from three years' point of view, I think we have come uh, a long way from where we have started. You can see the cross-pollination and the sponsorship and the mentorship that happens when one project is successful and that project starts to scale. It has evolved into something that almost has a life of its own inside the company um, and will continue to evolve and grow. One Billion Lives is continuously investing in the passions of aspiring entrepreneurs Ideas workshops take place all over the world where the next generation of projects come to life. To start looking at problems or opportunities. What things are out there that you think could do with being fixed or could work better? You've got to tear the heartstrings because that's the only way you're going to stick with it and make it work. If I had a crystal ball, what I think realistically will happen is the world will get worse. Uh, there's going to be more natural disasters, more pressure on the natural ecosystem. Plants and animals will suffer. We'll see more extinction. We're also going to see that in humanity. You know, it's going to be uh, some really big issues will come. And those are going to ignite more movement to do the right thing for individuals and for businesses. And what I hope will happen is as it gets worse, it also gets better simultaneously. And that through a lot of struggle, mind you, we emerge in a purposeful type of capitalism that can be sustainable and is much more than just about the amount of money we make. I don't know where the next spark of passion might come from. I don't know where the next idea might come from. I don't know where the next moment for someone might come from. But what I do know is that with the One Billion Lives program, there is a framework with which they can take that idea, that moment, that passion and put it into action.